Hello, we'd like to thank the conference organizers for hosting us today and organizing the schedule. Today, Savannah and I are discussing Cost of Living Aleda by the American artist, Josh Klein, where fabrication techniques are similar to those already discussed at the conference. This series comprises a commercially produced utility cart illuminated with LED lights and 3D printed body parts and tools used by Aleda a cleaning staff member at a boutique New York City hotel are placed on the cart's shelves. Klein used photogrammetry to capture Aleda's head, hands, and tools. The photos were imported into a CAD program, which transformed them into a 3D surface model, which he digitally manipulated and then printed in color variations with a polymerized plaster. Klein provides the collector with, with the ability to print new components as printing technology progresses. At a time of production, the available print resolution that was used was substantially lower than what was held in the resolution of the digital files. As printing advances, the print output will have a greater resolution until one, at one point it'll match that of the file data. One of the pleasures of this object is that Klein leaves the materials and that of the visual results up to an optimistic belief in future technology. It's an agreement that the collector or museum is a willing participant in the possibility of change. Cost of Living was completed in the fall 2014 as part of an ongoing series of portraits on the people of the losing end of the American economy. It was inspired as he encountered while subleasing in a space of an office building and ordering equipment that was delivered by FedEx and UPS people. Examples here is what is called the series Packing for Peanuts, where he incorporates FedEx and and UPS labels on the 3D printed body parts of its scanned workers. For cost of living, Klein was considering hotel staff and asking who cleans up our society's mess and who's maintaining the new boutique hotels of the new New York City architecture of our time. To make this work, he's also thinking about scanning working people, processing them through the computer and exporting them through different formats such as sculptures, images, and video. Like any work that needs a set of instructions for the installation and care, Josh Klein created a set of rules and guidelines for these sculptures, which allows the possibility for an improvement in the future. If his goal is to bring the printed elements closer to the data, then I believe that Josh also himself sets up an end game, either knowingly or by definition of our time. In Josh's words, quote, Unlike video, which is decreases in resolution and looks worse as it migrates to higher resolution display platforms. In the future, as elements of the work degrade or break and are reprinted, the realized work resolution will increase until there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the resolution of the file and the resolution of the print, end quote. The Whitney's Interdisciplinary Replication Committee conducted a series of formal and informal discussions with Josh to lay the groundwork for the museum's long-term care of this object. Additionally, Josh was interviewed as part of the artist documentation program, which we'll be using today to hear some clips in Josh's own words. In this first clip, Klein talks about capturing photos of Leda. So yeah, we, we used the camera um, and it was photogrammetry, and, um, but really poor photogrammetry because it was just a single camera. And you know the subject would have to stand very still you know, hopefully the wind wouldn't be blowing too much, and then we would shoot all these photos, um, and then take them back into the studio and run them through this free software called 123D Catch, which would produce a very, very rough 3D model, um, which would then get reworked in a software called ZBrush endlessly um, by a 3D model or with me art directing next to them until I got something that matched the photographs we took in my eye. And 3D printing is rapidly coming to the point when the output will surpass that of, date of Klein's stored data. There will also be what I'm calling his end game, when the data capture will be much lower than our capable output. And these parts will look very old and dated, much like a 1980s Dwayne Hansen or a figure of an Alice Neal painting and how they look retro to our eyes. In his discussions, with the committee, Josh has always made it clear that the dating of this work and catalogs and wall labels should always remain 2014, no matter when the prints are printed. 
In one sense, a more nuanced understanding of this work and the unwritten date is also tomorrow in parentheses. I would like an Aleda cost of living to an ominous sci-fi story where the narrator indicates this happens in the very near future. In sci-fi, the far future can be firmly represented by flying cars and spaceships and we're all perfectly comfortable with this. However, the near future is more unsettling, not dated today, but coming up. And if you don't know when, maybe tomorrow. This agreement for the near future is the leap of faith that collections make with all instructional art, be it Solowit drawing or a Yoko Ono instructional art works. To participate in the future of tomorrow, our museum needs a firm understanding of the parameters of the game. Josh does an excellent job of creating through a series of discussions, and handbooks, what, where, when, and how of reprinting would look like. Josh explains by first defining his preferences for when and what materials to print in the future. So in the future, when these are reprinted, it's kind of, the material doesn't matter to me as long as it doesn't look any worse than whatever was used the last time. So it can't go backwards. So looking worse means? Like a lower resolution printer. Okay. I mean, I guess I've thought a little bit about it. At a certain point, you know, there will be a one-to-one -one correspondence with the files. Um, and then at that point, it's just like whatever printer makes the most sense, you know, whatever the most affordable, best printer is at the time for kicking out 3D prints um, or whatever comes after 3D printing. Cost of living Aleda is also similar to our understanding of work such that of the light strips of Felix Gonzalez Torres, where one will need to source and adapt to create the works as rubber sockets and light bulbs degrade or that of cut paper silhouettes of Kara Walker where the elements can be replaced and repaired but don't bring into question the authenticity of the work. Cost of living fits somewhere in between those objects and it'll be up to the dialogue between the collector and artist to determine how that future unfolds. In our conversations with Josh, she wanted to make actually absolutely clear the actual work is the experience of human being encountering the sculpture in front of the work. Go ahead, talk about it. Well, one thing that Ben wrote in the article, even though I just I told him that it was not the case, he insisted that for me the file is the artwork. And I think if I'm on tape, I do want to say that the yes. file is not the artwork. Yes. The objects are the artwork. Yes. Um, and something else that you know was kind of asserted in that article was that you know that these objects are not the finished work because in some way I'm waiting for the better technology, uh -huh. and I don't feel that way. Like, uh -huh. I think these are very much the finished work, and part of the work is that it will change over time. Um, and I feel, like, about the file, the same way that I feel about my video files. Like, you know, the video files are important, they're an intrinsic part of the work, but they're not the work. The work is the experience of sitting in front of the monitor or projection and watching the video. That is the work, like the person with the work. Um, in space, and I feel the same way about the sculptures. The file is just like a technical part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, these archival and conservation aspects are just part of me thinking about, well, how can this work translate into the future as the technology changes? Um, you know, but it's, it's um, you know, for me, it's like these objects um, are, the, are the work. It exists now, it's not like incomplete. Well, now pass it over to Savannah who will discuss the technical side of the work. Thank you, Margot, for that great overview of the work. I'm going to talk about cost of living Aleda from more of a digital preservation perspective today and about the 3D model digital files themselves. Even though Josh Klein himself says that the digital files are not the artwork and that the actual objects are the artwork, it is still, of course, highly important to conserve the files as components of the work. There are many questions surrounding this work regarding when and under what conditions it could be reprinted, but in order to even have that option of reprinting in the future, you first need to have the digital files and make sure they are compatible with the printers of today and eventually the printers of the future. As part of my role at the Whitney on the Media Preservation Initiative Project, which launched in 2018, the museum has developed new digital preservation infrastructure using the platforms Archivematica and Resource Space, and along with that, work flows for how we care for digital artwork files in the collection. As part of that project, I also began systematically going through every physical media component in the Whitney's collection, 
from videotapes and optical disks to hard drives and flash drives, as well as all of the digital files contained on them. This process also included backing up all those files onto our servers and then processing them to the digital preservation pipeline. So I was first introduced to cost of living Aleda through the hard drive pictured here. And then of course, all of the digital files on it. Looking at the file formats for each printed component of the work, Josh Klein pr provided a .zvd file for printing purposes, and then a folder of backup files that included a ZTL, which is a project file for the 3D modeling program ZBrush, a WRL 3D model, and a JPEG image. The big question we had concerning this work was, are the files we have suitable for reprinting? And the answer we came to was, no, not really. We contacted LaGuardia Studio, which is a 3D printing studio at New York University, and is also the same studio that originally printed Cost of Living back in 2014. Through consultation with LaGuardia Studio, we learned the ZBD printing file was proprietary to the printer used when the work was first printed, and that printer has long since been superseded by other models that print at higher resolutions. LaGuardia Studio also no longer even has that model of printer, and thus would not be able to reprint this work from the ZBD files. So we determined we needed to migrate those files to another format that was more open and broadly supported. Before I go into more details on file format migration, I have a clip of Josh Klein speaking on obsolescence and 3D printing. With the printers, like ideally they would be fully photographic, but the printers can't match the resolution of the files yet. So, and also just these these materials and the printers themselves, they're all made for rapid prototyping. There's no kind of uh, archival no. thinking going on no. at the companies or in any way with these, these objects and the materials. And so I, I just knew that these, these sculptures were gonna have like a kind of inbuilt obsolescence, um, which would be fine with certain works, but with these I want them to continue into the future. And so with, with these sculptures, I see them very much as like solid videos in a way, like I think of them as like solid videos. And as with video, you know, like the DVD may get scratched, but you can just burn another one and then you can keep playing it. And then at a certain point, DVDs may go away and then you burn a Blu-ray and then the Blu-rays may go away and then you just have a succession of like, you know, higher and higher resolution lossless files. And that's how you would see the genesis of these to keep going. Exactly. Um, except unlike video, which will look worse and worse as it migrates onto like higher resolution platforms, these will actually get better looking. Um, Here Klein compares this work to video and the nature of evolving technology being difficult to conserve over time, especially when the companies producing it aren't thinking with more of an archival mindset. I think this is something with time-based media conservation we are deeply aware of and concerned with because as custodians of these works, we need to think about them in a more of a long-term way. And one strategy we have for keeping up with newer hardware, such as 3D printers, is to migrate the digital files to compatible formats. As previously mentioned, the ZBD printing files we had were no longer supported and needed to be migrated. In August 2019, myself and Taylor Healy, a conservation fellow at the Whitney at the time, went to LaGuardia Studio where we were very kindly allowed to work in their lab and they also offered guidance throughout the process. They only had one software program that could even read the ZBD files and they had very luckily just gotten it shortly before our visit. Pictured here is what one of the Aleda models looks like in 3D Sprint. And through this program, we migrated the ZBD files to the OBJ file format. We chose to migrate to OBJ for a variety of reasons. First and foremost is that it's widely supported in 3D printing and 3D modeling programs in general. It is an open source format, so it's not proprietary to one specific printer or brand. It can be used across many. And another advantage of OBJ is that it supports color and texture information, which other modeling formats like STL do not. And since these objects are of a real person and require photo accurate color representation, OBJ was deemed a suitable choice and was also endorsed by LaGuardia Studio. And here is what one of our OBJ packages looks like. Here is the file package for a model of Aleda's shoe with a yellow sponge texture on the inside of it. 
With these OBJ packages, it is actually three files working together to create the final model. First, there is the .obj file itself, which is the actual 3D model containing the geometry and structural information needed to create the shape of the print. And then there is the PNG, which is a flat image file that contains the color and texture mapping information. An OBJ package may contain multiple PNG files if more than one texture mapping needs to be applied to the OBJ. And finally, there is the .mtl file, which acts as the instructions that inform the PNGs how to wrap around the OBJ structure. While we have not yet attempted to actually make new prints from these files, at the very least, migrating to OBJ was a stopgap measure that will enable us to continue working with these files and supported programs. And if the media conservation and digital preservation communities later decide on a different file format that is best for the long-term preservation of 3D models, the OBJs would likely to be easier used as the basis for another migration than the ZBD files would be. Another thing we were able to do at LaGuardia Studio was open up the backup ZTL project files in the program ZBrush and create video documentation of each of the models. ZBrush has a turntable feature where you can rotate a 3D model on its x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis and record a video of it. We save these video files of the turntables as additional documentation of the work, seen here in GIF form. These video files are also accessible in our internal viewing platform resource space to curators and researchers who want to look at this work. Resource space can't display 3D model files natively, so these video files are very handy to have an idea of what the models look like without accessing either the original files or the actual sculptural objects directly. And just in closing, I will turn things over to Josh Klein one last time, and he can speak in his own words on how he sees this work evolving over time as printing resolution increases and components are reprinted. In terms of the sculptures, like where the print, the prints that are on the sculpture. Um, you know, with those, I don't think it's so important to lock them in, or even possible to lock them into the technology of 2014, because um, you know the printer that these were printed on, they no longer make it. They've already, it's already advanced, and so later editions of the sculpture are actually higher resolution now than the ones that are here mm -hmm. even. There's like another model hmm. beyond this. And when I look at the newer prints, I can already see the difference in terms mm -hmm. of, of like a slight jump in resolution in like the prints. And, um, and so I think it's kind of hard to like, and the printers are so expensive and obscure and like hard to maintain that I just saw it as being like counterproductive to lock them into that one technology. Um, yeah, because it would just be a nightmare, like a conservation nightmare. Yeah, anyway. it, it would be challenging, to say the least. Yeah. And in the long run, it would get in the way of like exhibiting the work so in the future. So at what point <clears throat> shall we, should we be remaking them? Um, you know, I tend to say like as elements break, you know, they should be, if they can't be easily fixed, they should be reprinted. And then is that, you reprint all of them on the card? No, 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 no. Just, just, just the one that's broken. So you're okay if they're looking different. Yeah. And finally, we would like to thank the following for the invaluable contributions to this project. Josh Klein, our colleagues at the Whitney and the Conservation Department and on the Replication Committee, the Artist Documentation Program, Taylor Healy, and everyone at LaGuardia Studio. Thank you all.